Hi, I'm Kelly Swanson, motivational speaker and a comedian, which means I tell you you can do anything, and then I tell you I'm just kidding. But I'm not here today to really make you laugh or inspire you. We'll save that for another day. If I do, it's purely by accident. Today I'm here to talk about my favorite subject, storytelling. It's something that I have been studying, using, and teaching my whole life, the power of story. Now I know what you're thinking. Wow, motivational speaker, I thought she'd be skinnier. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> you're probably thinking, she's like a cross between Melissa McCarthy and Reba McIntyre. Yeah, I get that all the time. And the rest of you are probably thinking, what in the world does storytelling have to do with us? I get that all the time. In fact, I asked myself that same question when a group called me a couple of years ago. And they asked me to speak at their direct sales convention, wanted me to talk about storytelling. And I was so excited because I love salespeople. They're my jam. We speak the same language. And this was a big company, so this is going to be a feather in my cap. And the woman said on the phone, oh no, um, you're mistaken. We don't want you to speak to our salespeople. We're in research and development. We want you to speak to our scientists. Scientists, like lab coat, microscope, discussing the intricacies of Star Trek scientists. I was like, does not compute. I said, hey, I understand my topic and the power of story, but I don't really understand how storytelling will apply in such a scientific world in your lab. And she said, well, we're, when we're in the lab, we know what we're doing. She said, we serve on teams all over the world. We go out there and we create these amazing products and work on these big projects. She said, but then we have to come out of the lab and we have to sell these products internally to the higher ups to get them to fund it and buy into it. So they'll make it part of this vast product line. She said, not only that, then once the product has been incorporated, we have to get in front of the internal business owners and pitch it to them, educate them, tell them how it works, because after all, we invented it. And not only that, she said, but then we have to motivate them to go sell that product in their own communities in this wide choice of products they have to choose from. She said, we're not so good when we come out of the lab. Our global consultants are telling us we need to be better storytellers. Can you help? I decided to secret shop them. So I went to one of these events where their scientists would be coming in and pitching the product to a room full of internal business owners. The product had already been incorporated into the product line. So this was the stage where they're motivating the business owners to go out there and pick their product to sell. I was so excited. I'm sitting on the back of the room trying to blend in with my little notepad and my pen and my little muffin, ready to watch the scientists in action get up on a stage. The first scientist gets up there, they lower the lights, they pull up a PowerPoint, and the first slide is filled with words, like a quadrillion words, in like a size two font. And I couldn't read a single one of them, but that's okay, because apparently <laughs> he was going to read them to me. Every word for word four word in the same pace with the same expression. And then he had another slide with more words. And it might have been okay if I could have understood a word he said, but it was like he was speaking an entirely different language. It was like he was reading the label off a bottle of cough syrup. I didn't even know what the product was. I was starting to get hot in that room. And I'm thinking to myself, Kelly, you're dumber than you thought. You're not understanding a word of this. And so I looked around to see, was anybody else getting it? And they weren't. Nobody was paying attention. They were on their phones. They were texting. The lady beside me had already finished her grocery list and planned tonight's dinner. People were starting to do the universal head bob. The guy behind me was snoring. We weren't five minutes in. I felt awful for that scientist. I knew he had worked for years on this product, that it was near and dear to his heart. I knew that he'd spent a lot of time on this presentation, practicing it, perfecting it. And I'm sure somewhere deep down, he cared about what he was talking about. It just didn't show up on his face. 
It was obvious he cared, but they didn't. He had lost them in minutes. And often when you lose them, you don't ever get them back. He finishes his presentation, another one comes up, does the same thing. If you can imagine it, even a little bit worse. Now there was a moment of color when we had a chart, but it was more of the same, droning on. Every minute in there felt like an hour as scientist after scientist got up there. I'm thinking this must be what prison feels like. Somebody shiv me for the entertainment. I about figured out how to fake a heart attack and get out of the room when I realized we were on the last scientist before lunch. That was going to be my exit strategy. And because all the other scientists had gone over on their time, he only had 10, 15 minutes. I'm like, hmm, how's he going to do this? He bounces up on the stage. He pulls the lights up bright. No PowerPoint. He's wearing jeans and a Superman t-shirt. He starts with a joke. And everybody laughed. Not because it was funny. Because we were desperate. And he says to the room, he says, I don't have time to tell you everything that is in my product. He said, so today instead, I would rather tell you why this product means so much to me personally and why it will mean so much to you personally and to the people you serve personally. And he began to tell us the story about growing up in China and being a small boy and sitting with his sisters around the table at the holidays while his mother would decorate and prepare. And he said she would arrange this big floral centerpiece that was her pride and joy, a reflection of her and their family. He said, and while my sisters would giggle and gossip, my mother would explain to me the significance of the prominent flower in that centerpiece, the chrysanthemum. She'd say it has a long history in our culture. For its healing properties, it represents nobility and grace. It is the flower, she said, that will bloom when all others are fading. He said, I remembered my mother's hands when she would arrange those flowers. They were perfect, flawless, looked like the faces on my little sister's china dolls. They were her pride and joy, a reflection of her and all her friends would always compliment her on them. He said, but after we got older and my mother grew older, she began to get these spots on her hands, these big brown spots. He said, they didn't mean anything to us, but to her, they meant everything. They weren't just ugly brown spots. He said to my mother, they were a sign that her life was fleeting and she stopped arranging flowers. He said, that's why this product means so much to me. He said, it's an age cream made for women like my mother. He said, and we've searched all over the world to find just the right organic farms as you have requested to make a product out of none other than the healing properties of the chrysanthemum. He said, the women in your communities are suffering. They're spending thousands of dollars on products that don't work until now. Ours will work in half the time for half the price. It got rid of my mother's spots in just three weeks. And now she's arranging flowers again. You have the ability to help those women in your communities with this cream by showing them that they can have the ability to bloom when all others are fading. And he walked off the stage and everybody just sat there and like that slow 80s clap moment and some had tears in their eyes. People were thinking about their own mothers. I remember busting through the door at lunch to go find him, pushing people out of the way, getting his card, giving him mine. I was like, I need your cream. I spent hundreds of dollars buying cream for every woman in my family, and some of us don't even have the spots yet. That scientist was the one everybody talked about for the rest of the day, and who years later is the only one I can still remember. Why? Because he didn't focus on what was in it, on the ingredients, on the data. He told a story. He put a human face on himself, on his brand, and on the people that he serves. That day, data lost and story won. And I saw the beautiful place 
where the two can meet. So what did Story allow that scientist to do? Four things, and not just for that scientist, but for all of us, and not just those of us giving presentations, but any of us who are in a position where we want to persuade or influence somebody else in business or in life. And all of us, no matter what your job, find ourselves in positions where we want to get other people to do what we want them to do. And Story was his secret weapon. The story allowed him to do four things. It allowed him to take data to a new place. The first one was from data to understanding. We all have information somebody wants. And many of us think, give them the information. They've got the facts, job well done. No, job not well done. Just because they have the facts and the information doesn't mean they understand it. And if there is one pattern I have seen in left-brained people, in IT people, financial planners, insurance, academia, higher intellect people, it's that they often tend to speak an entirely different language than the people on the other side. Story allows you to wrap your data in a context and a language they can understand. The second thing, it allowed him to take data to persuasion. Most of us, when we want to persuade somebody to do something, we actually have a vested interest that they do it. I don't want to just tell you what I believe. I want you to walk out of here and act on this information. And once I realized that, I realized that my role had to switch from being a lecturer to a salesperson. I know, we don't want to hear that, but we are selling our message. And I went to the world of sales and I said, how do you do it? How do you sell this message? And they all said the same thing, that people buy from people they like, people they trust, people they believe, and people they feel like they know. I got news. Your data, your PowerPoints, your facts cannot do that for you. It cannot make you likable. It cannot make you trustworthy. It can't establish a connection. But story can. Because story allows you to wrap that data in a way that it actually persuades your listener. They buy you first. Story allows you to connect and engage and earn the right to share your truth. The next one is it went from data to experience. We all learn the most from what we experience. We know that. If you want to drive a car, you're not going to just read the manual and then go get a license. No. First, they're going to put you behind the wheel of the car so you can feel what it's like to drive it. If you want to have a lasting impact with your information, if you can get your people to experience it instead of just hear it, it will have more of an impact. Story allows you to put your listener behind the wheel of the car and turn this into an experience. Don't believe me. Go believe the research. It's been done. Harvard, Psychology Review, Stanford. These people have done these studies. The science now backs this up. That stories have the ability to light up other parts of your listener's brain. We think in narratives all day long. Our words are stored as images. And what is story but an image painted with words? When you tell a story and you talk about movement, it lights up another motor cortex, part of their brain. When you mention an emotion, their brain starts searching for a relative experience that they have. One researcher even said that story allows us to plant ideas into other people's minds. What amazing power that is. Please use it for good. And the last one is that story allows us to take data to transformation. If I just needed a bottle of shampoo that would clean my hair, I wouldn't be staring at 500 bottles on the shelf in the Walmart. If I just needed a car based on the features of it and the products, salespeople would not be necessary. They know this because they know we don't buy the pieces of the car. We don't buy the ingredients in the shampoo. We don't even buy what you're selling. We buy the transformation it brings into our own lives. 
We buy the solutions to our pains and our desires. We don't buy your story, we buy ours. So many businesses come to me, I wanna tell my company story. We started in 1942 with the candle in a wagon. I'm like, no, 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 no offense. Nobody gives a rat's patoot about your story. They care about theirs. And if you can find a way to tap into their story and merge it with yours, you have a winning combination. Story gives you this amazing ability to walk your listener all the way through your message to the other side. It allows you to actually let them test drive your message. You want to get your employees rallied around change? It's not change people are afraid of. It's not being prepared for it. Show them the story of what that change is going to look like in their own specific lives and the pains and the desires that it will solve when you're through. Story allows you to show people the transformation that your message will have in their own lives. I'm only scratching the surface. My book, The Story Formula, can take you deeper into the weeds on this and how to put the story together and to look at all the different places that story has application. The only thing I want for you today is to be aware of this tool. And the next time you go out there and you're wanting to influence and impact somebody, think about whether story could have a place. How you can put a human face on yourself, on the brand, and on your customer. That is the beautiful illustration of how the art of story meets the business of persuasion.